Hi, good morning, everyone. Happy Endangered Species Day. I'm Dr. Innes. I'm one of the veterinarians here at New England Aquarium. And we're here today with my colleague, Carol, Kelly Chris, to talk about endangered species. Kelly, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and also want to say happy Endangered Species Day. My name is uh, Kelly Chris, and I'm the Director of Conservation Policy and Leadership here at New England Aquarium. I'm really excited to talk about endangered species with uh, Charlie today. And also, I want to wish a very happy birthday to my sister, Shannon. Happy birthday, Shannon. So Kelly, tell us first, what is an endangered species? Well, from, a, from the law's perspective, the Endangered Species Act provides a really specific definition of endangered, which is an animal or plant that is threatened with extinction. And that's all the guidance they give. They also provide a definition of animals that are, are threatened. And similarly, it's very specific. Uh, threatened animals are those animals or plants that may become endangered. So we have a lot of latitude to work with uh, when it comes to endangered. And, and I would turn this question back to you, Charlie, to see if there's anything from your perspective as a practitioner uh, that you can add to what those definitions are. Yeah, well, there's different levels of endangered, it seems, around the world and different countries have different definitions for it. So in the U.S., we have our Endangered Species Act, but there are other organizations that categorize animals around the world as endangered, threatened, and other categories. So in general, though, it does mean that an animal species is getting close to extinction when we call them endangered. So the Endangered Species Act, uh, it's a U.S. law. Um, when was it created and why was it created? The Endangered Species Act was signed into law in 1973. And I just want to step back and, and think back about this green decade of the 70s, during which President Nixon signed into law a number of really uh, important environmental laws for the United States, not just the Endangered Species Act, but also the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which was signed in uh, to law the year before in 1972. Uh, they, he also created the National Environmental Protection Act and created two really important agencies for the U.S. government, which are the Environmental Protection Agency and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, both of which play a really important role in, um, in our environment. And then for, just because we're talking about this, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act were also created in this time period. So that was a little background, but the Endangered Species Act was signed into law uh, to help protect the diversity, so the number of different animals and plants uh, in the United States, but also there was a global movement to protect the diversity of the planet. And we care about these things because uh, the more diverse animal number of animals and plants we have, the better humans are. Uh, they help us to generate air and, and keep the water clean. Uh, that helps our economies, it helps our livelihoods. It provides, uh, uh, it, it helps create an environment in which humans can be healthy too. So we all live in balance and the Endangered Species Act is one of those laws that helps us to protect the diversity of our planet, which again, just to reiterate, helps protect us. Uh, so I think that's the big why. Uh, and, uh, and so we can get into some of the details as well. Great, thanks for explaining that. Well, I'm gonna turn and ask Charlie some questions. Uh, I think it's really exciting whenever I see an endangered species in the wild, uh, but sometimes they can be really hard to spot. And zoos and aquariums can be a good place to come to see some of those animals. And so Charlie, can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the endangered species that uh, people could come to the New England Aquarium and see? Sure, we have a few species at the aquarium that are on the endangered species list. Um, one of our most prominent animals is Myrtle, the green sea turtle. She's our matriarch who's been with us for 50 years. And uh, green sea turtles are one of the endangered species that's protected under this law. We also, in the giant ocean tank, we have loggerhead sea turtles that are um, protected as threatened species under the law. Uh, our penguin exhibit is one of our most popular exhibits too. And we have African penguins there that are um, doing really poorly in the wild, but 
um, are being maintained uh, in captive populations by zoos and aquariums. We've also got uh, southern rockhopper penguins that are threatened in the wild. And another little bird that um, lives in New England that's an endangered species is the piping plover. We've got those um, in our shorebird exhibit. Uh, plovers tend to come to us when they're injured. And if they can't be released to the wild because they can't fly any longer, um, we often exhibit them at the aquarium uh, to teach people about their plight. We also have uh, an Atlantic salmon exhibit. People uh, don't often think of salmon as endangered species, but salmon have been affected by uh, damming of rivers, especially and overfishing. Um, and so the Maine population that in New England, in the state of Maine, the uh, Atlantic salmon is endangered and you can see those at the aquarium. We also have species uh, like the um, yellow spotted Amazon river turtle that um, has been affected in the past by hunting and poaching and the pet trade. Uh, those come from South America, but they are still listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Thank you, Charlie. I think you've named some of the favorite animals that people come to the aquarium to see. Yeah, so, so that really speaks to the, to the role of zoos and aquariums in potentially protecting these animals. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how the what zoos and aquariums are doing to help uh, the plight of endangered and threatened species? Yeah, there's a lot of different angles actually where zoos and aquariums are helping. Sometimes we just help outright by protecting habitat. Zoos and aquariums have put forth money and funding to purchase land, purchase uh, habitats where endangered species live, and that's one of the most effective things we can do. We also are involved with captive breeding programs that have saved some endangered species. I mentioned the African penguin earlier that we are breeding at the aquarium, but also species like the black-footed ferret, uh, the California condor, these were almost extinct and really were saved by captive breeding programs um, that heavily involved zoos. Um, also, we do a lot of scientific research that we'll talk about a bit later. Uh, and that research helps to understand the natural history and spatial distribution of these species. Um, we often figure out um, how to take better care of endangered species by working with them um, in a rehab setting. Uh, in New England, we uh, work with sea turtles that are stranded on beaches, on Cape Cod especially. And by studying those animals and helping them to get better, we have learned over time how to prov provide better veterinary care for them. So in addition to all the basic science that we do with endangered species, we're also advancing the medical science aspects of the programs. So back to you, Kelly. Um, how do species get put on the endangered species list when we notice a species might be coming rare? Um, how do we get them listed on that list? That's a really great question, Charlie. And I actually had to do a little research into this one myself. And it turns out there are two ways that a species can become listed. And so the first process is that people like you and me or organizations like the New England Aquarium can initiate a process by which uh, we propose that an animal or a plant become listed as either endangered or threatened. And, uh, and you need to provide all the scientific evidence uh, that, that would demonstrate that this animal or plant is in peril. The second process that uh, can happen is that the federal government can initiate the process itself uh, based on the exact same information. You need scientific evidence uh, that, the, that the animal, the plant, the habitat uh, preve is preventing these animals from thriving and surviving. Cool. So the average person can do this. Um, anybody can start a petition and uh, ask that a species get listed. Well, you technically you can. I in looking at the Fish and Wildlife Services website, it does look like it's challenging and difficult. And again, you really need all of that scientific information. But technically, it's possible. Yeah, and sometimes people join up with um, partner organizations, and the organization might bring forth a proposal. Um, good example of this in recent years, there's a few North American uh, turtle species that are protected in individual states, but they're not yet protected by the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And so 
Um, some organizations have been petitioning in recent years for several of these rare turtle species to get listed, and the process is ongoing now. So once a species is listed um, under the Endangered Species Act, what exactly does that do for the species? What protections do they get once they are listed? Yes, well, it's it's good news for the species who do get listed. Uh, their habitat becomes protected uh, so that they have the space they need to, to, again, survive and thrive. You can't kill or harm them. Uh, so, so, you know, that one seems kind of obvious, but I felt like I should say it. Uh, and then you also can't trade them. So you can't import them. You can't export them. And so that plays to some of the, 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 the information you shared, Charlie, about uh, animals that might be uh, not part, uh, part of the United States, but are uh, found in other parts of the world. We can't import those animals and we can't export our, our own endangered species. So really, uh, it, it, what happens when you get listed is that um, a management plan is created to help uh, identify all the things and the steps that would need to be taken to help the numbers of the animal or plant uh, to increase with the ideal uh, goal of taking of removing the animal from listing so that their numbers have recovered enough that they're no longer threatened endangered and that uh, and that they they won't become extinct which is the goal of the law right and one uh, part of the law that people don't always think about is the body parts of animals which are actually very um, lucrative in the illegal wildlife trade sometimes everybody's familiar with the illegal trade in ivory and rhino horn and uh, in the past tortoise shell jewelry that came from sea turtle shells. Um, not only are the live animals protected from being traded, but any of their parts are protected. And so that's one way that we can um, protect those species and inhibit the international trade in those body parts. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think we're going to get into some of the success stories. But since you mentioned it, um, I'll just raise the American alligator right now. Uh, and if you if we think back however many decades, alligator shoes and alligator belts and alligator purses were very popular. Uh, and so for an animal in our own care, uh, the success story of the Endangered Species Act has brought the American alligator back in, in really uh, phenomenal numbers. Yep, that's a good one. Let's see, is it, is it, it might be me now. <laughs> Your turn. It's my turn. Okay, uh, well, Charlie alluded to this earlier, but scientists at the New England Aquarium are conducting research on endangered species in the wild. So it's not just what we're doing in, in the building, in the aquarium itself. So Charlie, can you tell us a little bit more about the endangered species that our scientists are studying in the wild and how is that science being used to help um, these species recover? Yeah, I'll mention too, uh, the right whale team that we work with at the aquarium is one of our oldest um, functioning groups and one of our most successful groups. We've got a group of scientists that studies the North Atlantic right whale. This is a species where there's only several hundred individuals left in the whole world. It's a really small number. Imagine if there were only like 300 people left on the whole planet. That's what we're dealing with with right whales right now. Uh, so our scientists uh, have been studying them for decades to the point that many of these right whales are known as individuals. Uh, scientists follow them uh, throughout their migration from the southeastern U.S. up into the northeastern U.S. and Canada in the summertime. Um, we try to determine how many babies they're having, whether those babies are surviving. And one of the major realms of our investigations has been documenting the types of uh, problems that right whales encounter. So we know that a lot of whales are killed by interactions with fishing gear every year or uh, being hit by ships every year. And by doing a really thorough job of documenting all that, our group has been successful in um, implementing fisheries regulations that might seasonally prohibit uh, ropes and gear from being in the water when right whales are in that area. Uh, we've also been able to get some shipping lanes changed where these big industrial ships historically had been intersecting with right whale migrations, um, those shipping areas have been changed to allow the whales to pass more safely. But even with all of those efforts, the problem is still ongoing and the right whale population really has been pretty stagnant for a number of years now. 
um, their reproductive output is not great. And our scientists are working uh, regularly to try to improve that situation. Another species we work with in the wild in New England is the leatherback sea turtle. Um, these turtles are the largest turtle species in the world. They're the only living member of their family that still exists. There used to be more in the dinosaur age, but they're the only ones left. Some people refer to them as living dinosaurs. They've been around for around 100 million years. And uh, they feed mostly on a gelatinous food diet like jellyfish. Um, and so they're really interesting animals. They're uh, about five feet long or so when they're full grown. They generally weigh around 1,000 pounds or more. And uh, they go through these very extensive migrations. Leatherbacks that nest in uh, the Caribbean are often found off the coast of New England in the summertime. Ones that nest in South America sometimes will migrate all the way out into the Pacific, to the other side of the Pacific. Um, ones that nest in Africa sometimes migrate over to the coast of South America. So you can imagine uh, swimming through the ocean for that length. It just puts you in so many different situations, so many different risks are out there now for these turtles. And so we've been studying them in New England to understand their habitats, their um, movements, and the risks. And like whales, leatherbacks are at risk from being hit by boats and also being wrapped up in fishing gear and ropes. And so um, one way that we've been able to try to help leatherbacks in recent years is uh, to use the information that we gather on their injuries and their rate of injuries and even the deaths that we see in leatherbacks and report that to the federal authorities that oversee the Endangered Species Act. There is a um, movement right now to lower the protection for leatherbacks. Um, some groups feel like the leatherbacks are doing so well that they shouldn't be listed anymore. And we've been trying to um, fight that by passing along information to federal agencies that show that leatherbacks really are not doing that well. And we think by giving that information, um, it helps us to continue to have them listed and continue their protection. Can I add something, Charlie? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you raised both with right whales and turtles the uh, that some of the many of the threats that are coming to these animals are from human caused uh, causes, and uh, and so I wanted to dig into a little that a little bit because what we haven't been able to, to say is that we're currently in the in in what's called a mass extinction event. Uh, the UN put out a report, the United Nations last year put out a report that uh, they estimate that a million species are at risk of going extinct uh, in the very foreseeable future. And that's an awful lot of animals um, and plants for the um, for the for the planet to lose, and so I just wanted to to say that in many cases this this mass extinction event is due to interactions between humans um, and the natural world. And so I think that as we're thinking about the role of endangered species, uh, both the policy, the science is is the role that humans have in this, and and how while we're part of the problem. Uh, the solution is also within reach. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the saddest parts of it is that we know that species have been going extinct before humans even existed, obviously dinosaurs, right? But those things were happening from natural fluctuations, uh, meteors hitting the planet, you know, things that really are uncontrollable. But most of the extinctions that we've seen in the modern era, things uh, like the passenger pigeon, the great auk, the dodo, these are all animals that were pretty numerous and were mostly killed off by humans. And so um, we'll talk later about some of the ways that we can help to protect endangered species, but a lot of it is just changing our actions. I, t I totally agree. And I really love that you brought up deep time. I'm a geologist. Uh, so uh, I will just add for your fun fact today that there have been five mass extinction events um, in geologic history. And that we're then that this one that we're in currently is re being referred to as the sixth mass e mass extinction event. Yeah, yeah. So under the Endangered Species Act, um, part of the protection for species is delegation of this thing called critical habitat, and that's pretty important um, for defining critical habitat for species. So tell us what you know about that, Kelly. I will. I'll try to. I'll try to. Keep this simple, but if you can imagine, we as humans, we have our ideal conditions, 
uh, you know, how much, how much food are we eating? How much water do we need? What temperatures do we like? Uh, and so that's the same for animals and plants. They have uh, the, the, the conditions in which uh, they are able to survive and do well. And so critical habitat is really defined as that geographic space that they require um, to live. And so, uh, so critical habitat is actually defined in the Endangered Species Act and is part of uh, the, the, the things that are needed to protect the species once it gets listed. Uh, and so that's why it's important. We all need, we all need enough water, food, and, and space to, to live. Yeah. Do you want it's to add to the, that? It's one of the really simple concepts, but it's so hard with so many humans on the planet that need more and more space for our own population. But in some ways, protecting endangered species in a lot of ways is just like giving them pla a place to live where we're not going to disturb them. And many species would do well if we just did that for them and left them alone and didn't keep taking uh, more and more land away from them or water. I agree, and I forgot to mention the importance of temperature. Uh, since uh, as the as the climate is changing, temperatures are 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 fluctuating. They're becoming more unpredictable. They're increasing in some places, and in some places maybe not. And that that affects the habitat of animals who have evolved to occupy a very specific ecological niche. Um, and those th those were a bunch of of uh, more scientific words, but but we need to we need to think about the impacts that climate change is going to have on our ability to protect these species and ensure that they um, exist for future generations to uh, not only benefit from but but some of these species just give so many people so much joy when they when they see them either in one of our facilities or in the wild. Yeah, one other thing that bothers me about. Um critical habitat designations is just that it it's a very point in time sort of approach. It assumes that if we draw a circle around this habitat for this species and leave them alone, that they're going to be fine for the next two million years. But we all know that climate changes and land masses shift and places that used to be oceans are now deserts and places that used to be jungles are now Antarctica. And so I think we really need to have a broader view than just having habitats that we um, say this is where they are and they're going to be fine. We need connectivity of those habitats. We need animals to be able to move around to different habitats um, in order to um, change where they live. If it gets too hot in one place, they need to be able to move to a cooler place. So I'd like to see critical habitat be broadened a little bit to more of like a international, you know, corridors almost of, of habitats where animals can continue to move. Well, I love that you said that because uh, the aquarium has been working with a really broad coalition um, of, of, of groups out there who are advocating on behalf of the need to protect 30% of the planet, both land and sea, by 2030 in an effort to do just what you said, Charlie. Uh, to create the, that connectivity, to create the spaces that are needed for animals, uh, and uh, I have to keep saying plants too because they're part yeah. of they're equally uh, important part of, of of the ecosystem. And so uh, the aquarium really supports this, and it's scientifically driven. So that's the other thing that we really care about is that the science is informing the decisions that are made on on how to protect the planet and the animals and the plants that, that, that we all depend on here. Yep. Yep. All right. Page two, we're on to <laughs> more turtles. Oh, it's me. I get to ask a question. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm super glad that you mentioned turtles earlier. Uh, and so we're going to focus a little bit on turtles and, uh, I know that you're an expert in turtles, so uh, so I think it, this is a good thing to drill into it, just a little bit. Um, I, I have a question. As I mentioned, I'm a geologist, so I'll start with the basic principles. What makes a turtle a turtle? Okay, well, um, turtles are reptiles, right? So they're in there with crocodilians and snakes and lizards. Um, turtles are um, one of the only animals that have evolved uh, moving 
parts of their skeleton the outside of their body. And so the turtle's shell makes them pretty unique compared to all other animals. They've got the, uh, the top shell that's formed from um, parts of their vertebrae that have all fused together. And then their bottom shell on their belly that's formed from uh, what would be our the equivalent of our ribs all fusing together. So they're pretty neat. They're, um, they're cold blooded, so to speak, or ectothermic is a more scientific term. So they um, don't maintain their own body temperature, um, mostly except for the leatherback turtle, which does. Um, but they're mostly at um, the environmental temperature where they're found. And so they have to behaviorally do things to keep their bodies warm, like basking in the sunlight. And in the winter, if it gets really cold where turtles live, they may have to uh, hibernate underwater for periods of time. So they're pretty unique. They, uh, they date back through the dinosaur age a few hundred million years. Um, and uh, we're lucky that they're still around. I think like if you were to try to design a science fiction animal that still exists from prehistory, the turtle would be one of them. It's true. People really love the turtles. And, uh, and so I know we're, we're, we focus a lot on uh, the ocean and the marine environment. So how many different types of sea turtles are there? Yeah, right now there's seven sea turtle species that still exist. Um, most of those are found um, in U.S. waters, um, although there's one that's not. The uh, Australian species is called the flatback sea turtle. Uh, I've never seen one. I hope to get to Australia and see one someday. Um, but the other six species of sea turtles um, do live in waters uh, surrounding the United States. And is that the continental U.S., or does that include all of our, our territories in the Pacific and elsewhere? Yeah, some of them are very close to the continental U.S., so we've got species like the uh, the green turtle that's very common in Florida, the loggerhead turtle that's up and down the, the coasts of the eastern U.S. Leatherbacks uh, that we mentioned before are found along the east coast. They nest in Florida. They're also found seasonally uh, off the coast of California. These are leatherbacks that nest in uh, the Southeast Pacific, um, and they actually forage off the coast of California in the summertime. Okay, and I think we've talked just briefly about which ones can can people see here in New England? Yeah, um, basically there's four, and if you include the hawks bill that's here very rarely, there might be five. So we see pretty routinely in our um, stranding program, we see loggerheads, we see leatherbacks, we see green turtles, and we also see Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, which is the rarest sea turtle species globally. It's mostly found in the Gulf of Mexico as adults, and they nest off the coast of um, Mexico and Texas. Um, but the juveniles sometimes get washed out into the Atlantic Ocean and swim up to New England waters in the summertime. So we see those four species here pretty routinely. And then occasionally the hawksbill turtle. Hawksbills are more of a coral reef inhabitant, and so they typically are not found this far north, but every once in a while there's a straggler that gets washed up here in a storm or something. All right, and and what of, of the sea turtles you mentioned, are they all endangered or threatened? Yes, uh, all, well, six of the seven total species are listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Um, the only one that's not listed right now is the flatback turtle, as I mentioned, from Australia. And flatback populations aren't really understood that well. Um, in one of the other uh, organizations that lists endangered species, the IUCN, the flatbacks are listed as data deficient, which just means there's not enough information available at their population to decide what level of protection to assign to them. So sometimes when data deficient species are really investigated further, it's found that they're quite endangered and they get listed as endangered. But so far that has not happened yet. Okay, and what, what are the threats? What are the threats to these animals? What's causing them to become endangered? Yeah, well, we talked about all the human activities earlier. So uh, habitat loss is one major thing that uh, we worry about for turtles. Uh, sea turtles nest on really beautiful, usually warm, beaches with lots of sunshine. And uh, those are great places for humans to want to build hotels and resorts and vacation homes and all sorts of things. So the loss of nesting beaches over time has been substantial. Also, um, just the increase in human population over time has been a problem for sea turtles. In the past, when there were a few hundred thousand humans on the planet and hunting sea turtles, 
it was a very small impact. But as more and more people started hunting sea turtles and taking their eggs and eating their eggs and eating the adults, uh, it really caused problems for turtles. Turtles are very slow growing and slow to mature. And so an adult female sea turtle at her first time nesting might already be 20 or 30 years old. And the likelihood of a turtle baby surviving to reach 20 or 30 years old is very, very small. And so one of the worst things we can do for turtle populations is kill those adult turtles that took so long and uh, such a small chance of, of reaching adulthood. So anything that kills adults is bad. So humans directly killing them. We also hit them with boats that kills them. We catch them in fishing gear that kills them. Um, we put toxins in the ocean and plastics in the ocean that a lot of people have seen, uh, you know, the straw up the nose of the turtle and all these uh, pieces of plastic the turtles might ingest. So we've really done a lot to um, damage sea turtle populations worldwide. But it's all those things, perfect. like you said before, there are things that we can fix too. Yes, it does give us the, the, the prospect for a path forward and, and hope. Uh, and, and I think as people understand the plight of these animals, they hopefully are motivated to protect them. Yep. So let's see. Uh, it's back to you, Charlie. Yeah, so my question for you, Kelly, is whether you think the Endangered Species Act has been effective and whether there are any good stories you can tell that show that this has worked well. Yeah, I'm a really big fan of the Endangered Species Act. I like all the environmental laws from the 1970s. Um, I'm a child of the 70s myself, so I feel like uh, we were meant to be uh, paired together. I think the Endangered Species Act has been really successful. And uh, depending on the way that you look at it, uh, again, the, the law was passed in 1973. And so far, there's been about 1,600 animals and plants listed. And of that, 99% of those listed species are still with us. That's a really great measure of success in my mind. Uh, however, if, if, you, if you look at this from another way, which is are we being successful in helping these populations recover to the extent that they don't need protection anymore, that those numbers show something a little bit different. And um, as of 2016, only 34 species of the animals and plants listed have been taken off the list, which means that their numbers have recovered to the point, again, that they don't need protection. But I think that I prefer the, the, that we are not, the, the steps that we are taking under the Endangered Species Act are preventing animals from going extinct. And I think that that's the really important thing to keep in mind. And that if we want to delist these animals, we are, we are, it is within our capability to take the steps necessary to uh, increase their numbers. And some of those things might, uh, might be difficult choices, but, uh, but if we want to change that trajectory and, and help many more animals to recover, we can do that. It's within, it's within our ability to do that. I'll move on to your second, the second part of your question, which is what are some of the successes that we've seen? Um, I mentioned the American alligator. That, that species was near extinction, and now there are more than 5 million American alligators, which is a really great number. Uh, and uh, um, when I go to Florida or elsewhere, uh, it's always really exhilarating to see an American alligator. And so I feel really fortunate that, that we have... Um, that that was an ex a success story. I think the most iconic one in the United States is the story of the bald eagle. Uh, yeah. It is the symbol of our country. And in um, in the in the seventies, there were uh, about four hundred and eighty left, and that was that was because of of chemicals DDT specifically um, in the in the being uh, sorry that there that there was a lot of DDT in the environment and that was affecting uh, the bald eagles eggs and so the the animals were not able to reproduce the endangered species act changed that and now there are more than 14,000 bald eagles uh, in places where you can see them uh, and it's always it's always an amazing thing to see a bald eagle in the wild uh, yeah. I have to say 
since we are an aquarium, I feel like I have to I have to mention a marine species or two. And so uh, the gray whales and the humpback whales are also success stories of the Endangered Species Act. Humpback whales have come back from 12, only 1,200, uh, and now they're at more than 21,000. So all of these are, are real causes for hope in my mind and, and demonstrations of how effective laws can help us um, to help uh, help animals and plants recover. Yeah. Yeah, I know when I was a kid in Massachusetts, uh, it would be almost unheard of to see a bald eagle. And in the past year, there was one in a tree in my backyard. I saw one canoeing in the town next door to me. The my eagle family, was Yeah, bald eagles. And my family just this week went to see uh, nesting bald eagles in a nearby town. So it's, it's really great. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're on good news stories. So I read in the news a lot about uh, turtle populations that seem to be doing really well. And, and you know, we talked about some of the threats, but there's some there seems to be a lot of on the ground work that is helping turtles. Can you can you tell us if there's cause for hope for these populations? Yeah, for some sea turtle populations, they have been rebounding over the last few decades. Uh, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle is a good example of that, where they were nearly extinct in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And that was mostly thought to be from hunting um, and poaching of their eggs. And also many of them were being trapped in fishing gear in the Gulf of Mexico accidentally, especially in the shrimping industry. And so there have been a, different, uh, a lot of different aspects of uh, management to try to improve that. One of the really cool pieces of technology that's helped a lot are called, is called a turtle excluder device. And this is a um, piece of uh, mechanical equipment that gets installed in the shrimp nets so that when turtles go inside those nets and get caught as accidentally, these excluder devices provide these little trap doors actually where a, something as big as a turtle can get out while the shrimp are still retained in the net. And that resulted in a really dramatic decrease in the number of sea turtles that were being killed in fishing gear. Also, uh, nest habitat protection has been uh, enforced in the last few decades. So many sea turtle nesting beaches are protected. Uh, people that live around those beaches um, reduce the lighting on the beach at night so that mother sea turtles feel secure and baby sea turtles don't get confused by bright lights uh, when they hatch. Um, we've also, in most countries now, just these protection acts that where we can no longer hunt and kill sea turtles have been helpful. So um, populations of things like the green turtle in Florida, um, leatherbacks until recently in Florida, and Kemp's Ridley's seem to have been helped by a lot of these um, management tools that we've been implementing. Um, one of the things I worry about is the um, perpetuity of the Endangered Species Act, right? Whether it's gonna stay in effect, it's just a law, you can change laws, um, we can weaken laws, we can make laws go away. And I've heard a lot uh, in recent years about concerns that the Endangered Species Act might not be strong going into the future or might get weakened somehow. So what can you tell us about the current status of the law and any threats to the law? Yeah, the, the, the law is almost 50 years old. And as we've discussed, there's been a lot of success, but, uh, but it also... You know, as we've talked about today, that there's the balance between human needs um, and 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 ecosystem needs can sometimes come into conflict, and and so the in the the environmental laws of this country sometimes are painted as um, as a as a barrier to economic development, uh, and so. And so there are efforts to try and, and weaken what how the how the law is interpreted and how it is implemented by the by the federal government. And so in the past couple of years, um, uh, there have been proposals to to change the way that the law is implemented, and some of those change the definition um, of critical habitat, which we've already discussed. Uh, the law allows critical habitat to be protected even if the species doesn't actually currently exist in that habitat. So you can protect it for the future in case you need to use that habitat uh, to, to, to help a species survive in the future. Um, 
So that's one of the issues. The one, the one of the really big ones is the law is very clear that as you're considering listing a species, only scientific and commercial information can be used in that discussion. You cannot discuss what the impacts are um, economically. Uh, and so that right now there's a proposal to include economic, uh, the economics of a decision in that process, which of course would change the outcome for many of, of the species that have been proposed uh, to be listed as threatened or endangered. There's also a discussion of the word foreseeable future, which isn't specifically designed, but we talked about climate change and this is how, how climate change would be uh, used in discussing the impacts to a, to a species um, if you if you change the definition of what foreseeable future is, uh, that means you may or may not be able to take into account changes anticipated because of climate change. And so all of these things, oh, the other really big one, uh, excuse me, is that right now, uh, endangered species and threatened species receive the exact same uh, protections, regardless of which one you are. But the proposal would remove the protections for threatened species. Um, so they would no longer be treated equally under the um, under management and uh, on how the species are are managed by the agencies. So yeah, one other um, one other angle that I worry about myself is uh, there's been some discussion about easing the restrictions on uh, liability of um, damage to endangered species. So when you know, let's say there is a an oil spill like happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Currently, the oil companies would be held responsible for damage that that oil spill does to endangered species. Um, and one of the concepts that's been discussed in weakening the law recently is that uh, corporations or entities would only be held responsible for damage to endangered species if they did that damage intentionally. So if they kill a whole bunch of endangered species accidentally, they wouldn't be held liable for it. And I don't think too many people are going out intentionally killing endangered species, but uh, things can happen that accidentally kill endangered species all the time. And those currently, that those situations do result in liability for having killed them. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. So beware. And when uh, we as the public and members of the public have opportunities to support the strength and current status of the Endangered Species Act, we should do so. I totally agree. Uh, let's see, we've got we've got some time left and I know we're going to go to Q&A, but I do because uh, because we're in New England uh, and we've been talking about sea turtles, I wanted to ask you, um, I've heard that Massachusetts is home to to freshwater turtles that are endangered. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, well, a lot of our native turtle species are endangered, um, not just the sea turtles. And um, the two that are federally listed under the ESA right now are the bog turtle, B-O-G turtle. These are little tiny guys that live in very small populations and very specialized habitats um, around the eastern U.S. And there's only a few places in Massachusetts where they're found. Uh, and these got federal protection a number of years ago. And so in addition to be protected by Massachusetts law, they're protected by federal law. There's also a really pretty turtle here in New England called the red belly turtle. It's found um, in the Southern US, but for some reason there's a relic population of these in New England, uh, in Plymouth County, Massachusetts in particular. And uh, when these were discovered in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s, there were only around 300 individuals known in the population. And so to prevent their extinction, Massachusetts started a program of protecting their nests. So they put little cages over their nests so the eggs are protected. And then when the babies hatch out, we uh, started what's called a Head Start program where we raise those babies in captivity during the winter of their first year of life. And by doing that, we get them to a size that's much larger than they would be in the wild. And being larger in size makes their likelihood of survival more likely. Uh, so they won't get um, you know, eaten by a bullfrog or a bird or something like that if they're a little bit bigger. 
And that prog program's been really successful. The number of red bellies in Massachusetts is about 10 times what it was in the 1980s right now, mostly from these Head Start programs. And then we've got a lot of other turtles in mass, like the spotted turtle, the wood turtle, the blandings turtle, the box turtle, that are um, state listed, but not yet federally listed. And unfortunately, they're becoming so rare that they may end up federally listed soon. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. We might be done with our questions. We can probably go to Q&A fairly soon. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Sounds great to me if you guys are ready. Sure. Um, so we have a question from Charlene who asks, you guys talked a lot about turtles, but what, um, what pinniped species are endangered? I can take that one. Um, I'm aware of a few. The uh, Guadalupe fur seal is listed. Uh, it's a species that's found in the southwestern coast, sometimes stranded along the coast of California. Uh, also, some of the monk seals, there were monk seals historically throughout the, the oceans. The Hawaiian monk seal uh, is very rare right now. And then one that we think is probably extinct is the Caribbean monk seal. Uh, that's a species that uh, existed off the southeastern U.S. historically uh, and hasn't been, a live one has not been seen in quite some time and they're presumed extinct. I'll add that the stellar sea lion is an Endangered Species Act success story. Great. Um, Penelope seems surprised that bullfrogs eat turtles. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about, um, about specific predators. Sure. Uh, for turtles, some of the things we worry about are uh, species, especially that are um, enhanced by human activities. Sometimes we call these subsidized predators. So things that uh, species that like to live in proximity to humans. So things like raccoons, rats, skunks, uh, crows, ravens, um, these things that thrive when there's abundant food available from human sources. Uh, many of these like to eat little baby turtles or turtle eggs. In the spring in Massachusetts, in the next month or so, if you walk around near lakes and ponds, you'll often find these nests that are dug up that have little eggshell fragments all around them. And those are turtle nests that uh, were dug up by raccoons and skunks frequently, and um, all those eggs have been eaten. So we do worry about that. Um, in the southwestern U.S., there's a big problem in recent years with ravens that have learned how to eat baby desert tortoises, that's an endangered species. Uh, and so we do worry about a lot of these introduced predators or subsidized predators for endangered species um, predation. Great. Um, Penelope also asks, what can the people that don't work with you guys do to help endangered species? Great. Kelly, do you wanna take some of that? I have my ideas, but you may have some too. I think the two of us can probably uh, take a take a good uh, stab at this uh, from the policy perspective. And, and Charlie actually already mentioned this is that uh, if if we care about endangered species uh, in this country, it's it's imperative that we communicate with our decision makers that we care. Uh, and that we don't want to see the Endangered Species Act or any of our other really important environmental laws uh, um, weakened, that, that we want to ensure the survival of, of the amazing diversity of our country and our planet, not just because it's good for the animals and the plants, but because it's good for us too. So please reach out to your, uh, your U.S. House of Representatives, congressmen, your senators. You can do that locally too. Make sure that, that your local officials in the state legislature know that you care. Uh, and that and that's true for the city. So if you have opportunities to communicate, I encourage you to do so. Supporting any organizations that um, protect habitats, in my opinion, is really important. Uh, organizations like the Nature Conservancy that just goes around buying up big plots of land and trying to make continuous habitats for these species. Uh, and making habitats in your own yard is actually a good thing to do too. We've got uh, history in the U.S. of wanting to have the perfect golf course lawn and get rid of all the trees and so we don't have to rake our leaves. But 
Making your yard a wildlife habitat is really helpful. Um, native plantings, um, composting instead of using chemical fertilizers, don't use herbicides, don't use pesticides, all these things help. And when you think about it, the, the, anything you put on your yard gets washed down, gets into a stream, the streams go to a river, the river goes to the ocean, it's all connected. And so even though we don't think that, you know, things we're putting down in our yards are problematic, it, it really is. Um, also, any laws that you can um, support that protect um, the trade in wildlife is helpful too. In the U.S., believe it or not, in a lot of states, it's legal to collect uh, wild animals and sell them into the wildlife trade. And the United States actually is not great about this. We export a lot of animals for sale to other countries, um, and people in the U.S. are profiting from that. There's also um, people in the U.S. that are doing illegal activities. We uh, are prosecuting people in the U.S. for poaching wildlife pretty routinely. Um, people realize that rare species are valuable and they decide they're going to go collect a whole bunch of them and, and sell them to other places. And so um, making sure that our laws protecting wildlife are really strong is important. That looks like all of the questions for now. And that was a great answer to wrap up on, I think. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a really wonderful endangered species day. Yeah, me too. Get out in the world and go see some of these animals too. They're out in your backyard if you look hard enough. And then come see us when we open our doors again. <laughs>